Good evening. Welcome to APTN National News. I'm Melissa Ridgen. We begin in southwestern Nova Scotia, where National Chief Roseanne Archibald, after giving a speech in support of Mi'kmaq fishers, boarded a Mi'kmaq lobster boat. It was surrounded by fisheries officers, and she witnessed firsthand Mi'kmaq lobster harvesters fighting for their treaty rights to harvest. APTN's Angel Moore was also on that boat as it all went down. Here's that story. APTN was on a Sabaganagati Mi'kmaq lobster boat, the Sadie Sea, when it was surrounded by fisheries officers on six Zodiacs and a large Coast Guard vessel. The traps were seized, but Marcel Marr, captain of the boat, says he will keep fishing. Someone's got to stand here and fight the fight, so it might as well be me if I want further generations or my children to participate in our Aboriginal fisheries. Mar and his crew had argued with the DFO officers earlier that day at Soniaville Wharf. Officers said the tags were not recognized by the DFO and the traps would be hauled. Marcel and his family still went fishing. Regardless of the situation, I decided to remove the tags and fish under a moderate livelihood for my Aboriginal treaty inherent right. This was the same day as the federal leaders debate in Gatineau. AFN National Chief Roseanne Archibald was also on the wharf to voice her support for the Mi'kmaq fishers. Promoting peace by respecting First Nations sovereignty and jurisdiction. Respect and peace go hand in hand. Otherwise, unhealthy conflicts will continue as we have seen here on the East Coast. After the speeches, Archibald Sabaganagati Chief Mike Zack and the other dignitaries went treaty fishing. Zack's crew hauled about 150 pounds of lobster. Back on shore, Zack told reporters he did not expect DFO to intervene. Just picking on a small person, right, and um, really trying to hit our people in the pocket, and um, it's very unfortunate. You know, they had an opportunity to get a, a bunch of chiefs, a national chief, and they chose not to. After Sack and Archibald left the area, the Sadie Sea was surrounded by the DFO. Archibald heard about that and came back on a Mi'kmaq Zodiac, manned by Sabaganagati protectors. The DFO is like banging up against the boat, uh, trying to stop us from moving forward. Uh, that experience, um, I think, you know, Canadians have to understand that uh, the Mi'kmaq people are really working at just inheriting they're asserting their rights and this is what happens to them it's it's absolutely not right and it has to be corrected jolene marr is the captain's sister she and her family have been fishing for generations and fighting for treaty rights just as long that was such an honor to have her come stand with us my family and i as we went and asserted our treaty rights and for her to witness what our people go through on a daily basis here. Archibald says she will continue to call for the federal government to uphold treaty rights. Really upsetting to see their traps being taken from them. They have an inherent and treaty right to uh, do the lobster traps and the DFO is interfering with that. And uh, there's a great injustice that's happening here right now against the Mi'kmaq people and their fishery. The Department of Fisheries say the Mi'kmaq must fish within the commercial season. The Mi'kmaq lobster harvesters say they will continue to treaty fish any season. Angel Moore, APTN National News, Chibuktuk, also known as Halifax. Last year, a recovery home dedicated to Indigenous women opened in Calgary. Well, the program was so successful that the nonprofit organization behind it has opened several more. As Tamara Pimentel shows us, addiction rates are increasing within the Indigenous community there, and the homes are needed now more than ever. For Edie Severite, this home was a major turning point in her healing journey. When Red Woman House opened its doors a year ago, it was the first house dedicated to Indigenous women recovering from addictions. It was like a fresh start. It was awesome. Um, just being able to connect with other Indigenous women, all with the same mindset. We're all fighting for our lives. I know I certainly was. 
Now there are five of these homes across Alberta for Indigenous men and women, and it's served nearly 60 people so far. The houses are part of the Oxford House Foundation. Executive Director Earl Thiessen is from Loon Lake in Saskatchewan. He attended Oxford House before opening homes dedicated to Indigenous people. Seeing the lives of people transform, I've been witnessing it for 12 years. I've been witnessing it in myself, right? I, I broke the cycle in my family of, of addiction and, and all types of trauma. Severite is another success story. The 60 Scoop survivor moved in here with the intent of staying for one month, and six months later, she was ready to move out on her own. Now she's been hired as a board member for Oxford House. You know, my, my addiction brought me to a very, very dark hole, a very lonely dark hole. And it's, um, it just seems so far away. But I'm just so grateful. I'm so grateful for this house. There's, I know that I would not be here if I didn't have this opportunity. Having the connection with elders, um, being able to attend ceremony that um, Oxford would, would, would give us the opportunity to go to. What sets these houses apart from other temporary shelters? There is no time limit. There's a sense of family. The residents can make the space their own, and they're located away from triggering areas. Oxford House only asks that residents follow a curfew, attend weekly house meetings, and stay sober. Severite says more of these are needed across the country. It's, it's, it's absolutely crucial to be able to, to have a place where you, can, where you can plant yourself and feel safe. There's not enough. I think there's, you know, there's a, a lot of, a lot of hurting people out there who, who need these houses. Tamara Pimentel, APTN National News, Calgary. A unique ge geothermal energy project in northern BC is soon to be up and running. The Fort Nelson First Nation hopes to produce enough clean energy from the project to power 10,000 homes by 2025. APTN's Lee Wilson explains. The Clark Lake Field, signaling the completion of two geothermal wells in northeastern BC. Fort Nelson First Nation is one step closer to completing one of Canada's first geothermal projects, and it's 100% Indigenous owned. The plant will use heat generated from fluids inside the earth and create renewable energy. Chief Charlene Gale shared the importance of the project to the region. And we just want to bring a revolutionary project to our community so that we can share it with our neighbors and our relatives up in the north. And there's a lot of things that come with that, um, whether it's food security or, um, you know, powering um, the, the territory in a way that helps meet our net zero for 2050. The site was also renamed Tudeka, which translates to water stream in English. It was a former natural gas site repurposed for geothermal energy. The Fort Nelson region is not connected to BC's main power grid and is still dependent on fossil fuels. The geothermal project will help reduce carbon emissions. Scheduled to be complete by 2025, it is estimated to produce enough clean energy to power over 10,000 homes. One of the things that's most important and on the forefront of many First Nations minds when they think about economic is environmental stewardship. So there needs to be that balance that happens between the two. Uh, you can't have one and not the other, so you have to really find that balance. Fort Nelson secured nearly $100 million of funding commercially, as well as contributions from the federal and provincial governments. Chief Gale wants Tudeka Geothermal to provide enough jobs for her people to return home and inspire the younger generation to think of new career paths. Inspire them so that they can pursue career paths and stay close to home, but um, the, uh, the opportunities are um, nation building opportunities. It will create sustainable jobs for our community and neighboring communities in Northern Rockies. Lee Wilson, AP10 National News, Kitimat. The fourth wave of COVID-19 has hit all three of the territories, but how bad it is depends on which territory you're in. 
In Nunavut, the number of cases holds at just one, while last week's case in Rankin Inlet has recovered. Today, health officials announced a brand new case in Iqaluit. The, in the Yukon, there are 20 confirmed positive cases in multiple communities there. But the Northwest Territories is the worst hit, with 137 active cases there and an outbreak in Yellowknife that has caused the day shelter and sobering center to close. Well, last week we aired a story about the Métis designers showcased at the federal leaders debate. In that story, we misattributed the designs worn by Governor General Mary Simon at her swearing in ceremony. It was Julie Grenier's designs that she wore that day. Jake Freeman's designs were worn by an attendee at the ceremony. We apologize for that mix up. Well, we need to take a quick break, but when we come back, the star of that leader's debate, and no, it's not a politician, Merrick McLeod, the 18-year-old Ojibwe man who kicked off the reconciliation portion of the debate. He's here. Stay with us. Welcome back to the election trail now. Residents in the Northwest Territories have five candidates to choose from this federal election, with old candidates, new candidates, and even a few faraway candidates, or one. Here's Charlotte Moore Jacobs with what they all bring to the table. Of the 338 seats in the House of Commons, the NWT has but one, a single member of parliament to represent them. In this 2021 federal election, there are five candidates vying for the position. From Beshikon, Kelvin Cochilia with the New Democratic Party. He says he'll invest in all Northerners. When you look at our neighbors to the east in Nunavut, they already address 
housing crisis, mental health, addiction. When you look at the neighbors to our west, they talked about climate change and reconciliation. We're trying to build a united northern platform as three territories. And Jane Groganwagen from Hay River comes with more than 20 years experience in politics, having served as an MLA for five terms. She says she's running as an independent, so the focus can be unapologetically about the North. A lot of things that they dream up in the ivory towers in, uh, you know, in, in southern Canada don't really play out here that well. A lot of the initiatives that they come up with. Um, so I, I would like to see if, if, if the federal government has programs and services they want to deliver in the North, I would like to see them tailored to the North with an understanding of what the challenges are here and what would actually work here. Out of left field, but on leaning to the right, there's conservative candidate Leah Molson. She lives in Thunder Bay and hasn't ever set foot in the territory. While she hasn't done any interviews with media, she agreed to one with APTN News on September 3rd, but backed out a day before sending this text on the 6th. But the Green Party's first time candidate, Roland Lawfer, did speak with us. Lawfer of Yellowknife says his platform is about adding new renewable energy sources and technology to all 33 communities. That it will be production facilities for alternative energy uh, technology, as well as educational facilities. For example, Aurora College should get the funding that actually up here we can train our own environmentalists, our own environmental engineers, and also engineers and actually inventors for alternative energy sources. Lastly, liberal incumbent Michael McLeod of Jatikwe is campaigning to reclaim his seat for a third time. He says the North is finally on the radar in Ottawa, and McLeod promises to invest in housing, pandemic recovery, and more. The Liberal government has done more in the last six years for Indigenous people in the Northwest Territories than any government has done in the last hundred. We've moved that dial so far, it's going to be hard to match, and I want to keep that momentum going. And what do Northerners really want in all of this? Stay tuned till ballots are counted September 20th. Charlotte Moore Jacobs, APTN National News, Yellowknife. The English debate for party leaders last week included for the first time ever a segment on reconciliation. Asking a question in that portion of the debate was Merrick McLeod, a member of the Thessalon First Nation. He was a highlight of the evening. Here, take a look. Ani Bojo. In the Ojibwe culture, trust and respect is key to any relationship. Uh, oh, shoot. You got it, Merrick. Keep going. How can I trust and respect the federal government after 150 plus years of lies and abuse to my people? And as Prime Minister, what will you do to rebuild the trust between First Nations and the federal government? That was such a moment, and he joins us now. Merrick, 20,000 people submitted questions they wanted to ask party leaders. You were one of only five people to be selected. What was going through your mind when you got that call to come and ask your question? Um, I was a bit surprised, you know. I'm just some kid up from, you know, Sault Ste. Marie in northern Ontario, right? <laughs> we're a city that isn't really um, looked at, even in provincial or federal politics. So. Um, you know, being First Nations and everything, it was just, it, it was uh, pretty shocking. Um, but it was a very nice experience to get to do. Well, we all loved seeing you there to kick off that reconciliation uh, block of the program. You know, it was emotional to watch you pause in that moment. You know, what were you feeling? Um, there was a lot of stuff going on, both technical and emotional. Um, you know, I had an earpiece in, which you know, I've never done before, right? So I'm hearing the production team in the background, I'm hearing the moderator, I'm hearing the producer saying, okay, you know, it's uh, get ready, you're about to go up and, um, you know, having to be there and you know, be TV ready, right? In front of the camera and then boom, you got a million plus people's eyes on you. Um, and I was outside my grandmother's house um, who, you know, has actually been on APTN. Um, you know, she is, uh, I think it's about a year or two now she's passed so it was very 
um, heavy for me, very emotional. And so, you know, I had all that going on, but when the moderator said, you know, you got this, Merrick, I, I just felt this um, wave of support. I could kind of just feel everyone, you know, who's at home rooting for me. It just kind of all swept up and boom, pow, right? And that's when I was able to get that question out. And yeah, it was just a lot. <laughs> I was so happy when Shashi Curl, the moderator there, was like, come on, you've got this. Or, you know, Beverly Andrews and I were there for APTN. And I think we all just kind of stopped in that moment. It's like, Merrick. And so I was so happy when you came and you just like, you hammered the question. So I have to think, you know, what did you think of the answers that you got? I was a little disappointed, I'll be honest. Um, you know, I think a lot of them said the right stuff. Um, you know, they got the policy right, but you know their actions over the last six years or beyond hasn't really supported that i mean whether it's with trudeau you know a lot of the stuff he's doing is just now is that just because you know government takes time to get stuff done or was that because oh you know we're about to call an election uh let's get some good photo ops and you know with o'toole saying that residential schools are primarily about education right you know i had grad parents that went to residential school i know that's not true mm -hmm. you know my own mother who's only in her 40s um she's a day school survivor mm -hmm. and so you know there's a lot of trauma and abuse there so you know i was really hoping that the leaders at least one of them would really have that knockout uh, response and you know really understand why i was asking that question you know yeah. It's a big job, but someone's got to do it, right? And I'm not sure if one of them can. Well, do you feel that this election is different in how Indigenous issues and reconciliation are a priority, not for the leaders, uh, but for Canadians, for voters? Absolutely. Um, you know, especially with the unmarked graves, this is like a real kind of peeling off the Band-Aid and seeing, you know, how deep this wound is. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of people just think, well, it's, you know, they're just on reserves, right? Or it happened so long ago, mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's not really relevant anymore. And it is. And we're still dealing, especially with residential schools, the long-term effects. You know, yeah. our people are some of the least educated, are the most impoverished and have the least uh, economic and just overall opportunities in the country. And it's on our own land, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. So it's just, and that's not even mentioning the trauma, like you said, the trauma and all the impacts that the trauma has that we see, you know, every day in this country um, mm -hmm. among our people. Yeah, exactly. Well, we thank you. We love you. We love that question. It was so good to see you up there starting starting off that debate, uh, that portion of the debate. Thank you for joining us here tonight. We have much appreciation. Chimi Gwetch, and you did great yourself, Melissa. Don't, uh, you know, don't discredit yourself. Oh, thank you. Well, it's time for us to take another break, but we still have more news ahead, so stay with us.
it's time now for our photo of the day. William Fowler sent in this beautiful shot of the sunset taken just outside of Whitecourt, Alberta. William tells us that cloud cover and smoke from nearby fires created this unique visual. You can keep those photos coming. You can email them to share at aptn.ca and you could be our next photo of the day. Let's take a look now at tomorrow's weather. Off to the east coast, 19 in sunshine for St. John's, 23 in sunny in Halifax and Charlottetown. 12 with a mix of sun and cloud for La Grande River, Kujouac, 8 and showers. St. jean 21 and sunny, same with Quebec City. 25 and showers expected for London and Toronto, 19 in Sault Ste. Marie. 16 and showers for Sioux Lookout, Cap is casing, showers 15 degrees expected. Sunshine and 17 in the Paw, Puckatawagan and Thompson, both 13 in sunny skies. 17 and sunny for Winnipeg, 15 for Barron's River and sunny skies there. 22 in showers for Swift Current, 19 in sunny for Yorkton. 15 for uh, Buffalo Narrows and showers expected, 11 in rain there for Stony Rapids. 17 in cloud for Fort Chip, uh, rain and 18 for Fort McMurray. 17 in showers for Edmonton, 20 and sunshine for Medicine Hat and Lethbridge. 24 in showers for Kamloops, 19 in sunny in Quinnell. 14 in showers for Prince Rupert, 17 and sunny for Prince George. Whitehorse sunshine, 18 degrees, Rock River, cloud and 10. 15 in showers expected for Wrigley, Wati, 14 in rain. 11 in Inuvik and cloudy skies, maybe a chance of showers. Polytech, same thing, seven degrees though. Eight and sunny for Baker Lake, New York, five and sunny. Kenite and Iqaluit, both six and sunny. Well, before we leave you some sad news as we express our condolences for the loss of one of our own here at APTN, Matt Thorderson passed away over the weekend. He had started working with APTN behind the scenes in 2003, then joined us in the news department here in 2006 as a reporter telling stories for APTN News and its affiliate shows. Viewers will certainly remember the impression that he made. He could do the serious political stories, of course, but Matt loved the unusual, the quirky, the offbeat, and he always added his own personal touch. Ticket sales for Star Wars The Force Awakens could hit an all-time high, but will they compete with James Cameron's Avatar? Some say, You have failed me for the last time. Matt was a scoop adoptee. He was a survivor and originally from the Roseau River First Nation south of Winnipeg. In his younger days, he played defense for the Selkirk Steelers junior hockey team. He was 46 years old. Once again, our condolences to Matt's family and his many friends. Well, that is your APTN News to kick off the week. We thank you, of course, for joining us. I'm Melissa Ridgen, and I'll see you back here tomorrow. Have a great night.